solution. And he stressed that you have to take into consideration both of these concepts, that it is an illness of the body and an illness of the mind. But if you don't take into consideration both of those concepts, you won't understand the full dimension of what addiction is. And if you don't understand what the full dimension of addiction is, then you will wander off thinking everything is half-baked and half-okay, and it will come back very seriously and get you. So let's, play, let's pay real close attention here, because this defines the reality of the hopeless condition. Another beautiful phrase that Bill used in AA Comes of Age. Addiction. One needs to understand the verdict of inevitable annihilation. That's, I mean, that we're talking about a serious no-win, lose-lose reality. Okay, the illness of the body. Silkworth first called this a physical allergy. And we're going to look at each of these. Well, I remember reading this in treatment. And I thought, okay, I'm allergic to beer. Well, that really raised more questions than it answered because never once could I remember when I drank breaking out in a rash or starting to sneeze or getting a runny nose. The manifestations of an allergy, I understood, were very different than the manifestations of the allergy used in this context. It made more sense when I heard allergy defined as an abnormal reaction to a common substance. Now, my saying to myself, I had an abnormal reaction to alcohol, began to make more sense. The abnormal reaction, which is the allergy, which is the illness of the body, that the alcoholic has to alcohol is, when they put the substance in their system, is to the triggering of a cycle of craving. Very important word, craving. It's triggered in the alcoholic's body when they put alcohol in the system. And it's triggered to the dimension of how much alcohol you've had. When I'd go into a bar, my favorite bar in Walla Walla, Washington, the Green Lantern Tavern, at 5 o'clock after work, I'd order one schooner. At 2 in the morning, I had six schooners in front of me and a 12-pack tightly held between my feet. A reflection of the dimension of how much alcohol I thought I needed at that moment, respective of the craving that I was feeling. Now, craving is, 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 is simply, first the person takes a drink, then the drink takes a drink. That's the triggering of the cycle of craving. Then the drink takes the person. It's not necessarily the person deciding to continue to drink. There's also this reality of the physical reaction of the drink taking a drink. First the line snorts a line. For, I'm sorry, first the person snorts a line. Free will, anybody can do that. Then the line snorts a line. Then the line snorts the person. A life which some of you have just recently been living out. Now with drugs, it's, with alcohol it's an abnormal reaction to trigger this cycle of craving. My mother drinks a beer, she gets full. I drink a beer, I get ready for more beer. That's an abnormal reaction. With most other drugs, it's a normal reaction to trigger the cycle of craving. Because the craving comes right with the drug. My grandmother, getting sufficient doses, frequencies, and durations of Demerol in the hospital after surgery, would become physically addictive to Demerol. Now, if they forgot to bring her her hour of sleep dose, she wouldn't be able to articulate it. She'd just say, uh, nurse, something's wrong. I need something. I don't know what it is. I don't feel good. Oh, we forgot to bring you your evening Demerol. So with drugs, it's a normal reaction. They are physically addictive drugs. With alcohol, it's an abnormal reaction. But the result is the same. The result is identical. Once you put the substance in your system, you're not able to predict when you're going to stop once you've started. Now, my grandmother, eight weeks later, isn't down by the wharf trying to score street Demerol. We'll go on to talk about that difference. 
But the physically addictive properties of drugs apply to everybody. With alcohol, it's abnormal. But the result is the same. Quick question, quick diagnostic question. How many of you have ever used more than you planned on using? <laughs> and it wasn't the first time, and that happened last week, right? You decided, well, I better do something about this, get into treatment. We don't learn that from using. What we learn is how wonderful we can feel. But the inability to predict once you've predict when you're going to stop once you've started, resulting in the symptom of have you ever used more than you planned on using, is the reality of the illness of the body. And results in the conclusion that we can't use. If when you use, you put yourself in a situation that means you're not going to be able to predict when you're going to stop, then the conclusion is you can't use. Not unlike someone with another kind of allergy, for example, a shellfish allergy. There are people, when they eat shellfish, they have an allergic reaction, their throat swells up, they can't breathe, they, they fall, keel over, pass out, turn blue, a physician at a nearby table has a, a steak knife, opens up an emergency airway, and they survive. What's their conclusion that they can draw from their relationship with shellfish? Can't use shellfish. They can live a normal life if they don't use shellfish. But we have to look now at the other part of, the, of addiction that Dr. Silkworth talked about, the illness of the mind. The illness of the mind is characterized as a mental obsession. And obsession is one idea that forces out all other ideas. Simply enough, any obsession. An obsession is an obsession is an obsession. One idea that forces out all other ideas. I want to make it very clear, a distinct point here, that the illness of the body is triggered when? When you put the stuff in your system. The illness of the mind occurs when we're clean, detoxified, straight, dry, sober, not using. If you're fully detoxified and away from your drug today, it isn't the illness of the body that's going to get you, it's the illness of the mind. Six months later, it's not the illness of the body that's going to get you, it's the illness of the mind that's going to get you first. Our real problem centers in our mind because at some point we become obsessed with the idea, and I quote from the big book, the idea that somehow, someday, we will control and enjoy our using is the great obsession of every abnormal user. That's a paraphrase of the big book. The idea that somehow, someday, we will control and enjoy our using is the great obsession of every abnormal user. Now, we're able to see the truth about our using often the next morning when we're hung over, strung out, whatever it is. Say, man, that does, I just, uh, you know, I can't drink. I'm not going to drink. We're able to see the truth for a while. But at some point, our mind throws this idea out. Often, maybe when we're frustrated. And the idea reads something like this. I'll buy an eight ball and stretch it out over two weeks. <laughs> I'll buy 30 Dilaudid and only use two a day. I'll buy a six-pack, have two tonight, give two away, and save two for tomorrow. The Albert Schweitzer of six-pack buyers. Every one of you has a long, classic, personal, powerful list of the things that you've told yourself just before you used that convinced you that this time it will all be different. It's my daughter's wedding, of course I can have champagne. The point is that this obsession keeps us from seeing the truth about our relationship with drugs and alcohol at the physical level. Now there's a lot of terms that are used for obsession and illness of the mind. Illusion, that's seeing something that isn't true. 
The great pyramids of Egypt are still there, even though David Copperfield made them disappear. That's an illusion. A delusion. These all mean exactly the same thing. A delusion is believing an idea that isn't true. In other words, believing a lie. And here's a bumper sticker for you. When you act on a lie, you run into the truth. When you act on the lie that you can drink or use like a normal person, and you drink or use, you run into the truth, which is you can't use. When you act on a lie that on LSD you can fly by jumping out of a second story window, you run into the front yard, which is the truth about that. Keep in mind that it isn't the illness of the body that gets us first. It's the illness of the mind that opens the door to using again, that deceives us into thinking that this time all of that stuff isn't going to happen. Now, Al-Anon has the same problem. There's an illness of the mind in Al-Anon. Al-Anon is the organization, nar the organization for families, friends, spouses of people who are addicted. Part of their illness of the mind is thinking, this time, my efforts to save this person will work. When hundreds of times in the past, those efforts have only resulted in misery for themselves and opportunities for misery for other people. The conclusion that we can draw as can't use was from the illness of the body, from the illness of the mind, is we can't quit. Can't use based on the illness of the body and can't quit based on the illness of the mind is the verdict of inevitable annihilation, is the truth about addiction, is the reason that you're here. We often think it's a bad marriage or too much money or not enough money, 